All right, James Eugenio is the publisher and editor of KennedysAndKing.com. He just published a review in ConsortiumNews.com. Uh, that's Robert Perry's website called The Post and the Pentagon Papers, a review of the new film, The Post. Um, before we start, this is published in Consortium News. Do you want to say a couple words about the passing of Robert Perry? Yeah, yes, I would. I, I, um, it's a real loss for journalism. It's a real loss for people who are interested in alternative, you know, sources of information. And I think it's a real loss, whether we know it or not, for this country, because in my opinion, Robert Perry was the finest journalist in America for about the last 20 years. And they're really, I mean, come on, there's other people who have bigger names, like Bob Woodward, you know, and Seymour Hirsch. You know, there's other people who have much wider circulation, like Michael Isakoff. But there was no one, in my opinion, who could match what Bob Perry did in about the last 20 years. And by the way, I should say before that, because if you take a look at the stories he broke when he was working in the mainstream press, I mean, it's, it's really a very impressive list going all the way back to Reagan's illegal war in Central America to his discovery of drug running by the CIA. He was the first guy to write about that with his partner, Brian Barger. He really went after the Iran-Contra scandal. Um, and he was the best journalist, I believe, on the October surprise. And he was the first guy to link Iran-Contra with the election of 1980, you know, tracing the arms shipments back to the whole October surprise thing, showing that although that they went under separate names, they were actually connected. Bob, he worked for three mainstream organizations. He worked for the Associated Press, he worked for Newsweek. He worked for Bloomberg News. And that, all told, was about a period of 10 or 12 years. All right? And he did amazing work. Then he just decided that American journalism had become so polarized. It had been so much enthrall to the neocon movement that had taken over both Washington and the media that you just couldn't do honest work anymore. So that's when he decided to go out on his own and started first a paper magazine called Consortium News and then he turned that into a online magazine. And he was probably – he started this. He cashed in his retirement fund, hmm. all right? And I think he started in 95, and at the time of his death, which was just a few days ago, you know, he was still going strong. He published it for about 22, 23 years. He did not take advertising, none at all. He survived on his fund drives, all right, from the people who appreciated his kind of journalism. And there were quite a few people. And I owe a lot to Bob because he published my first movie review back in 2011 when I did a review of Clint Eastwood's J. Edgar. That had been turned down by Salon. So Lisa P. said, why don't you try Bob Perry? So I sent him the article, and before I knew it, it was up. 
mm. you know, is up on his site. You know, and so since then, I've done, I did several articles. Well, not several, more like 20 or 30, you know, most of them film reviews, but also book reviews, you know. And my latest one, I guess that's the best way to segue into my review of the Post and the Pentagon Papers. And by the way, I have to say, the last time I talked to Bob was, I think, the day after Christmas not knowing that he had the first of his series of strokes on Christmas Eve. It ended up that he was he died of pancreatic cancer. You know, even though he had regular checkups, I guess they couldn't detect it. Hmm. Now, I really, really hope, I think his son and Kelsia are going to try and make it a go. They're going to try and keep it going. So I really hope everybody who's listening to this, please go over there, and if you like it, and I don't see how anybody who's listening to this couldn't like it, go ahead and contribute whatever you can, all right, and, and become you know, part of that group because there isn't anything like it, in my opinion. None of these other – you know, the great promise of online journalism was pretty much stillborn, all right, I believe. There was a big flurry of this stuff. You know, with things like the Huffington Post, you know, and Talking Points Memo, you know, um, would be another one, Daily Coast and things like that. And in my opinion, none of them ever fulfilled, you know, what, what we hoped they would. All right. None of them. And which, of course, you know, I've said in other forums, the paradigm, the high point of American journalism since World War II, I believe, at least mass journalism, was Ramparts Magazine and the LA Free Press. And none of that, none of those things that I mentioned ever came close to it. You know, Bob was the only person who came close to it. Because he, for, he, for him, there was no taboo. There was nothing sacred. He's one of the very, very few sites that let writers like myself and Ray McGovern, you know, talk about the the Warren Commission and the assassination of President Kennedy without assuming the Warren Commission was correct. You know, I can't think of any other site, you know, except well, maybe Op-Ed News. That's about it. But Op-Ed News is really more of a blog. It's not. It doesn't do magazine stories. You know. Bob, the and by the way, Bob let me write some very hard hitting and long articles. The only time he ever caught me was when I went on too long. He thought, you know, most people online editors say that you know the readers don't like reading really, really, really long essays. Okay, so he caught me once for length. That was it. All right, and you know, and Bob let you do that. You know, so it's it's a really great loss. I mean, myself, Leno Sanic over at Black Op Radio, you know, I think it's me and Lisa Peace are talking about Bob's death, you know, and then Oliver Stone on his Facebook page. And I'm very surprised that his death was noted by the New York Times and the Washington Post, you know. But it's a very severe loss to the United States. And I, I just hope the Consortium News survives i really do concerning how good he was what a great person he was he let me write this 10 page review of this newest steven spielberg tom hanks production uh called the post which is supposed to be based on the pentagon papers case but it's really not and when I heard it was coming down the pike, I called up Daniel Ellsberg, and I asked him, I said, is this going to be based upon you? And he said, no, Jim, it's not based upon me. I said, what's it based upon? And he said, it's based upon Catherine Graham. Hmm. I said, what? And he goes, yeah. I said, are you a consultant? And he said, not really. 
I said, you mean they didn't put you under contract? He said, no. Did they talk to you at all? He said, one guy called me once. <laughs> now, I'm sorry to laugh, but I, if you know anything about the Pentagon Papers case and you're making a movie about it and you talk to Daniel Ellsberg once and you don't even put him under contract to consult on the film, I mean, how serious of a film are you making? Because the whole point is that the Pentagon Papers, that case went on for almost three years, okay, from late 1970, okay, to not the summer of 1973, it went on, all right? And when you talk about the Pentagon Papers, it's such a wide expanse of material, of locations, of personages that there's really three things you're talking about when you're talking about – most people don't know this because most people haven't read. There's about 12 or 13 good books on the subject, and I read most of them for that review. All right, But first of all, there's the Pentagon Papers themselves. This was a secret study commissioned by Bob McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, in the summer of 1967. He, by this time, was having severe doubts about Johnson's conduct of the war, President Johnson's conduct of the war. And if you recall, by this time, Johnson's policies had completely overthrown what Kennedy's policies were. All right, because Johnson had done something that Kennedy was never going to do, which was commit large amounts of combat troops into theater in South Vietnam. I think by this time, there were probably at least 450,000 combat troops there. It was going to peak out in the spring of 1968 at 540,000 combat troops. All right. Now, there's a lot of reports about Johnson's the conflict that was beginning between Johnson and McNamara at this time. When McNamara commissioned the Pentagon Papers, one of the reasons he labeled them top secret was that he didn't want Johnson to find out about them because he knew that they would get terminated. All right. And so the chain of command on the Pentagon Papers was from his deputy, John McNaughton, to McNaughton's assistant, Morton Halperin. And then Morton Halperin assigned Leslie Gelb, the research analyst, to conduct a day-to-day -day operations of putting together this en encyclopedic study. It, it came out that it's really a total of 49 volumes. Most people, including myself, thought it was 47. But there's actually a, a, two more volumes that were found. All right, so it's a, it's, And it's really about 7,000 in this entirety. It's about 7,500 pages. And it's a combination – the way it's constructed is that it's a combination of narrative telling the story of American involvement going back to 1945, studded with documents throughout proving the facts in a narrative. I think a, a good estimate would be that it's about 4,200 pages of narrative with about 3,300 pages of documents. Hmm. All right. Pr proving the story itself. Now, this went on for 18 months. And I think one number I saw is that Gelb eventually employed 91 researchers to write the Pentagon Papers. All right, and one of them was Ellsberg. All right, so that's one of the ways that Ellsberg knew about it. All right. If you've ever read the Pentagon Papers, and I strongly recommend you read at least a summary of them. There's a good summary uh, that just came out 
um, which is the New York Times, what they printed, uh, which was, I think, five days of stories, three days before they were sued, two days after they were sued. But it still comes to about 700 pages because at times their articles were very long as opposed to the Washington Post articles, which were about one third the length of the New York Times articles. All right. And that's a good summary of them. All right. You can also buy a CD and which has all 49 volumes of them. But the point of the Pentagon Papers and what was so shocking about them is that through these top secret documents, they proved what many people, especially the leftist intellectuals, suspected that the American people were being lied to about this war from the beginning. You know, there's one absolutely sensational document in which McNaughton in 1966 tries to justify Johnson's escalation of the war. And he says, it's 10% to help Vietnam. It's 20% to avoid Chinese expansionism. It's 70% to avoid a humiliating defeat. In other words, the reason we were unleashing Rolling Thunder, the greatest bombing campaign in the history of mankind, was so that Johnson did not lo- would not lose the war. And by the way, that was Nixon's reason too when he took over. He actually said that to Bob Haldeman. I will not be the first American president to lose a war. So in other words, all these people, and you're talking literally millions of people, you know, had to perish because Johnson and Nixon didn't want to be the first presidents to lose a war. Well, of course, if the American public would have known that, you know, they probably would have impeached them. You know, but this was one of the secrets. And another one was it was the first time in the Pentagon Papers where the real questionability of the Tonkin Gulf incident was exposed. All right. Of course, I think everybody listening to this will understand. The Tonkin Gulf incident occurred in the late summer of 1964, August. There were, it took place over three nights. By the third night, there were two American destroyers involved, the Turner Joy and the Maddox. And they accompanied these uh, South Vietnamese speedboats that would perform attacks on the North Vietnamese coast. When the talk and golf incident first came to light, Johnson said that number one, the American ships were in international waters. Number two, they were routine patrols. And number three, they had no association with the South Vietnamese speedboats. In other words, it was all an accident. It later turned out, of course, with the help of the Pentagon Papers, that we found out that all three of those were to be polite, wrong, to be more brutally honest, lies. All right. Okay. Because, number one, they were not routine patrols. They were going up and down the coast of North Vietnam because – those destroyers had special electronic equipment that were trying to find radar stations and targets. They were in conjunction with the patrol boats who would then attack them and find out more information about things like radar. And some of the time they were not in international waters. They went actually in and out. It later turned out that, and I think this is on the Pentagon papers, both McGeorge Bundy and George Ball admitted that they were provocations. Now, 
Johnson said that there were two attacks on the American destroyers. Well, that was false, too. The second attack did not happen. All right. And the first attack consisted of one bullet through one hull. Okay. Now, what kind of a president goes to war when not one American life was taken? Not one American casualty happened when you had one bullet through one hull and it was you provoking the attack. But that was another revelation in the Pentagon Papers that Johnson, although he ran as the peace candidate and he tried to caricature Goldwater as the unrepentant hawk, Johnson was actually planning to enter the war, he was planning to break with Kennedy's policies. All right, That was also first exposed in the Pentagon Papers. So that's – when you talk about the Pentagon Papers, there's that. There's this encyclopedia, this massive, almost invaluable for its time, okay, uh, multi-volume exposure through top-secret documents that were never supposed to see the day and, and that Ellsberg got possession of. All right, now, so that's one thing. The second thing when you refer to the Pentagon Papers is the Supreme Court case. This was caused by Ellsberg and his friend Tony Russo, who decided that they had to copy the Pentagon Papers and get them to the public. When the study was completed which I think was at the end of 1968 or the beginning of 69. Two copies, there were 15 copies. Two copies went to Rand Corporation where Ellsberg and Russo worked. All right. And Ellsberg, of course, knew about them. He got permission from, I think, Morton Halperin because I think John McNaughton had passed away at this time in a car accident and he got permission from Morton Halperin who used to, when he worked at the Pentagon, which Ellsberg did. Okay. Um, he worked under Halperin. And so Halperin allowed him to read them. All right. He'd never allowed him to copy them. All right. And, but, but he knew where they were. And so he smuggled them out. All right. And, he and his friend Russo, Anthony Russo, Russo had a girlfriend at that time named Linda Sine, who owned an advertising business in L.A., and they had a copying machine. They didn't want to go to a public copying place, of course, for obvious reasons. And so they night after night, week after week, month after month, they copied this set of the I – think, I think they ended up copying – 45 of the 49 volumes, all right? And they copied those because, see, what's so interesting about Ellsberg is that he began as a hawk, all right? He was a hawk in the Vietnam War. He had served in the Marines for, I think, three years, graduated from Harvard. I think he ended up getting a PhD in economics, all right? And was working at Rand Corporation. You know, and as time went on, and he began to see these conflicting reports about Vietnam, he volunteered to go over there, which he spent two years in Vietnam. And it was that two year experience which showed him that the war was hopeless, that it was a complete fraud. That the government of Saigon that we were propping up could never win the war. You know, that lives were being snuffed out, you know, mostly on the Vietnamese civilian side in a cause that was simply never going to have any kind of fruition. All right. There's all his book. I can't recommend enough. His his, his 2002 book, Secrets is a very good book. You know, if it's 
you know, there's about, like I said, 13 books on the Pentagon Papers case. His is one of the very best. All right. If you want to learn just about the Supreme Court side of it, James Goodale's book is the best, Fighting for the Press. So once he got the volumes and copied them, he brought them to Washington, and he went to four politicians hoping that they would read them into the congressional record mm. because he thought that would protect him because through the free speech and debate clause in the Constitution, you cannot be questioned if you're a senator or congressman about where you got information that you spoke about on the floor. Well, for one reason or another, and you can read his book to find out, Fulbright senators, Fulbright, Matthias, and McGovern all turned him down, as did Congressman McCloskey. So then he decided, well, I don't want to do this, but it looks like I'm going to have to. And so he went to his friend, Neil Sheehan, who we knew from Vietnam, who was a reporter for the New York Times. He invited Sheehan to come up to his place in Cambridge because by now he had quit his job at the Rand Corporation and he had gone east to work at MIT on a teaching fellowship. So he calls his old friend Neil Sheehan, who interestingly was also turning on the war. He had been a hawk. All right. And he had now gone through a metamorphosis in 70 and 71, like David Halberstam had done also. All right. And they now were seeing that what they wanted to happen, which was more American involvement, which Kennedy did not want to do. And they had both criticized Kennedy for not committing combat troops and more ordinance to the theater. Well, they got their wish in spades with Johnson, and they saw that it was a terrible mistake. So now they're both trying to atone for what they had done. And so by 71, Sheehan had now become a dove, and he now was working at the New York Times. Ellsberg invites him to go up to Cambridge, looks at the papers, he does this for more than one weekend, and then Ellsberg was leaving for a vacation one weekend. He made a mistake, gave Sheehan the key, and of course, David, any curious journalist, what do you think he did? All right. He copied the papers, <laughs> all right, when, when, when he wasn't there, all right, without – and by the way, he didn't tell Ellsberg he had done it, Oh. Hmm. all right? So – and he wouldn't return his calls when Ellsberg tried to call him, you know, and he kept it all secret. In fact, Ellsberg found out that the Times had the Pentagon Papers from a different reporter. All right. And he didn't find out that they were going to print them until about two days before they published. Nice guy that Neil Sheen, you know. All right. And so uh, what happens is. That once they're in the possession of the New York Times, this is when James Goodale, the general counsel for the Times, enters the picture. He had heard in March that the Times had come into possession to a veritable pile of classified material. And we're talking now 71 and Nixon's president. He suspects that even though the Pentagon Papers don't mention Nixon because they stopped in 68, that Nixon would do something about this because Nixon and his vice president, Spiro Agnew, had declared an informal war in the media. All right. Now, I mean, it was pretty bad what these guys did. All right. Um, you know, if you recall, Spiro Wagner and is calling the press nittering nabobs, you know, and attacking these media empires of the New York Times and the Washington Post and, you know, and, and trying to challenge licenses in 
for the Washington Post, Newsweek organization in Jacksonville, etc. So Goodell had a really good idea that the Nixon White House was not going to accept this, even though it really didn't concern them. So he started mapping out a defense, you know, in case they were sued. All right. So what happens now is that there's a great debate inside the New York Times between the reporting side and the management and lawyer side. All right. The reporting side led by managing editor Abe Rosenthal, wants to publish. Most of the executives and their legal counsel say no. Abe Rosenthal threatened to resign, and he said several of these reporters are going to resign also if you don't print this stuff. And so Punch Salzberger, the owner of the Times at that time, then decided to go ahead and publish. Now, leading up to that, I think June 13, 71 was the first story. There was top secret security at the New York Times because they thought the FBI was going to raid the building. Hmm. And they had actually placed a reporting team in two different hotels. All right. Because they were that worried that the FBI was going to swoop down and take the classified documents away. And in those secret hotel rooms, there were security guards all along the high, the, the, the hallway. They, that's actually in the film, the post. They actually did a nice job in that showing the top secret security that the New York Times had. All right. So the first day, June 13th, 1971, the New York Times devotes a four, I think it was a four column headline about this secret archive of how America got into the Vietnam War. And on the first day, Nixon really doesn't do much. Charles Colson tells him, look, this is all about Johnson. So let them tear each other apart. Don't get involved. And so he doesn't. Well, on the second day, Henry Kissinger enters the equation. And Kissinger, after studying the whole Nixon administration for too long, Kissinger knew just what buttons the press with Nixon to get him going. All right. And it was like, really, after listening to these secret tapes in the White House between Nixon and Kissinger, it was like psychologists call a folie la doux. It's when Two personalities get together, they create a monster. Hmm. And that's what happens with Kissinger and Nixon. All right. Kissinger says they're subverting the government. They're making you look like a weakling, etc. And these, of course, are the buttons that you can press with Nixon. All right. So the second guy who caused the Pentagon Papers to go to the Supreme Court was John Mitchell, the attorney general. Nixon then calls Mitchell and he says, can we stop him from publishing? And remember, Nixon had been a lawyer in Mitchell's law firm. John Mitchell was a bond lawyer. All right. He was in no way a First Amendment attorney. OK, well, he tells Nixon, yes, there's a president for it. All we have to do is call them in advance and warn them, which was utterly and completely wrong. James Goodell, the general counsel for the Times, had done some research on this, and he realized that the Times had a very good case because of the prior restraint doctrine. In England, which has an official secrets law, you can employ what they call prior restraint. That is, you can stop someone from publishing in advance. All right. In the United States, we don't have that. All right. So <clears throat> when the, Mitchell called the Times, or I think he sent them a telegram, requested they stop publishing. Goodale told them to ignore the request. All right. 
So when they did, Mitchell then went to court, and he got a temporary restraining order. And this was the beginning of the ultimate Supreme Court case, which I think would be decided about two weeks later. So when the New York Times was restrained from publishing anymore, this is when Ellsberg decides to go to the Washington Post, except the film, the Post, very much distorts this. Hmm. First of all, Ben Bradley did not have a spy go up to the New York Times building, all right, illegally enter and see a four-column spread with Sheehan's. In no book I read did that happen. And two of them, one of them was by Bradley, the other one was a biography of Bradley. So I'm sure if Bradley had done that, he would have wanted every public to know. All right, it didn't happen. The guy who influenced Daniel Ellsberg to go to the Post was a guy named Dunn Gifford. Dunn Gifford had worked for the Kennedys, Bobby and Ted Kennedy, lived up in Cambridge, all right, and was a friend of Sheehan's. He said, why didn't you go to the Post? Why don't you go to the Post now that they stopped at Times? In his book, Secrets, Ellsberg says, on my own, I would have never thought of going to the Post. And in my review at Consortium News, I try and explain this, a point which I'll get into later, why he probably felt that way. All right, so anyway, that is how he decided to call Ben Bajikian, who he knew from Rand Corporation, who was now a reporter for the Post. And Bajikian drives up to Cambridge. All right. No, actually, I think he flew up. He flew up to Cambridge and meets him in a motel room. And Ellsberg gives him a much shorter version of the Pentagon Papers. I think the Washington Post version was 4,100 pages. All right. So they put these in a couple of boxes. Bajdikian puts them on a plane. He had to buy a second seat on the plane. All right. Flies back. And the Washington Post now has the Pentagon Papers. All right. And so they publish for two days. And then, of course, the White House calls up Bradley, asks him to stop publishing. Bradley refuses. And now they get enjoined. So now there's a flurry of hearings, of hearings, which the film really doesn't do a lot of justice to. I think there were, if I remember correctly, there were two hearings in Washington for the Post. There were two hearings in New York for the Times, all right? And then finally, there was an appeal to the Supreme Court, and both cases were joined. Now, now, another deception in the film is this, that once the Washington Post was stopped from publishing, there's a scene in the movie where Bajdikian has a grocery bag which we don't see what's inside, brings it over to Bradley's desk and says word to the effect, I always wanted to be part of rebellion. Well, Bradley, played by Tom Hanks, takes it over to Graham's office and he starts taking out all these other papers who now have stories from the Pentagon Papers on their front pages. I think there were eventually 19 newspapers that got the, the Pentagon Papers. And Bradley in the film says, look what you caught. I, I, this, this was really kind of sick when I saw this. The idea that somehow the Pentagon Papers got out through Catherine Graham is ridiculous. You know, Once the court enjoined them, they couldn't do anything with the Pentagon Papers. It was Ellsberg and his group of young students, some young professors up in Cambridge, who now, with Dunn Gifford, got together 
and they started sending out the Pentagon Papers again to all the other newspapers. All right, and another thing the film leaves out is that there were two other newspapers that were that were enjoined by the Justice Department and were in court. And I think they were the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the Boston Globe. So there were a total of four newspapers who were sued. All right. But they couldn't stop it because Ellsberg and his volunteer group, who he has chosen to remain secret all these years, but one guy volunteered, historian Gar Alperovitz, recently volunteered and he admitted he was part of that group that got them all out to these other publications where it became kind of hopeless you know to stop it and then of course he finally did find a senator Mike Gravel from Alaska hmm. who agreed to read the Pentagon Papers into the congressional record which is that's a story in itself because Gravel was like not a senior senator at all. He was on this lowly committee, I think the Buildings and Ground Committee. He got the Pentagon Papers, realizing that almost nobody was there from his committee that night. I think he started like at 7 p.m. And knowing there would be no objections, <laughs> he started reading them into the record. The word got out. He had his staff start copying things, gave them to the press. He almost collapsed by about 11 o'clock at night. And he made a motion to commit the rest of the Pentagon Papers of the Congressional Records. If there was nobody there to object, it, of course, passed. And that is how the Pentagon Papers actually got into the Congressional Record. It was Mike Gravel. Hmm. Right, and, and this, by the way, that was the night before the Supreme Court decision. So really, in essence, what Mike Gravel did was he kind of made the Supreme Court decision a little bit superfluous because once the Pentagon Papers were transcribed, Gravel tried to find a publisher, which he finally did up in Massachusetts, Beacon Press. All right, and they published what has come to be known as the Gravel version of the Pentagon Papers. But the Supreme Court ended up ruling for publication. The New York Times lawyers were two superb First Amendment attorneys. Um, the late Alexander Bickel, a Yale law professor, and a guy named Floyd Abrams, who's still alive, by the way, of the, the giant law firm in New York, Cahill, Cahill Gordon, who I interviewed in advance of that review. Mm -hmm. And they did just a wonderful job. The Washington Post didn't like their firm, and they fired them like in, within the next year. All right, But Bickle and Abrams did a very nice job you know, defending the right to publish – without being prior restrained in America. All right. And so and that case has held up very well, I would think. When I talked to Abrams, he said he yeah, I think it's held up pretty well myself. You know? And so that was the other angle. That was the Supreme Court case and the Mike Gravel case. All right. That's another part of the Pentagon Papers. The third part of the Pentagon Papers is the criminal case which Nixon and Mitchell tried to prosecute in two locations. One was in Boston and one was in Los Angeles. In Boston, because that's where Beacon Press was, and in Los Angeles, because that's where Rand Corporation was. The one in Boston, the criminal action in Boston failed because Nixon and Mitchell tried to prove a conspiracy between Beacon Press, Gravel, the circle that was around Ellsberg, and Neil Sheehan. It didn't work because Gravel was protected by the free speech and debate clause. Plus, a number of witnesses refused to testify. Mitchell threw one guy in jail. He still wouldn't talk. 
And so that one collapsed. The one in L.A. indicted Ellsberg and Russo. It ended up that they indicted Ellsberg on 11 counts of theft and conversion and three counts for Russo, a combination of 115 and 35 years, respectively. So if it would have been the maximum, they would have been in jail for 150 years. Mm -hmm. right? A guy named Stanley Scheinbaum a very famous liberal philanthropist in L.A. raised the money for their defense, which cost $900,000. Today, that would be about $7 million. There was wow. no way Russo and Ellsberg could have paid for their defense. All right. That trial, which, you know, it's incredible to me how that trial is ignored. But at that trial... And hardly anybody knows this. John Kenneth Galbraith testified. McGeorge Bundy testified. Arthur Schlesinger testified. Arthur Schlesinger, in something that was just terribly overlooked, testified that if Kennedy had lived, there would have been no Tonkin Golf. There would have been no insertion of combat troops. There would have been no rolling thunder over Vietnam. And that should have been on the front pages of every newspaper in America at that time, but it wasn't. And the only place I could find it is in a book by Peter Schrag called Test of Loyalty. It's the only book I could find on the Ellsberg trial. Hmm. You know? And I thought that was just incredible because that was – the trial was, I think, 70, late oh, – 73, and JFK didn't come out till 1991. But Schlesinger was talking about that back in 1973. So I thought that was pretty important stuff. Well, what happened was Nixon – and to really understand how bad of a president Nixon was the, and how terrible of a, of a lawyer Mitchell was, you, this case really shows you because Nixon conducted five secret meetings on the prosecution of the Pentagon Papers. That's how bad he wanted to nail Russo and Ellsberg, you know, because he said that they were comporting with the enemy. Yeah, this is so ridiculous. Like, the North Vietnamese did not know that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was bogus. Right. They right. did not know that Johnson was going to escalate the war. General Giap, before he died, was interviewed uh, by a friend of mine, Manny Kang, uh, through his son. And he said, yes, we knew Kennedy was withdrawing. At the time of his assassination, we understood that. And we also understood that once the Gulf of Tonkin happened, that Johnson was going to escalate the war. So the idea that that, that, that is so, so ridiculous, you know, that you were aiding the end. What you were doing was telling the truth to the American people for once on a war that should never have happened. But thanks to Nixon and the Dulles brothers and Eisenhower, it did, you know. So, so Nixon conducted five secret meetings on the prosecution of Ellsberg and Russo. And what happened was that three things occurred that caused the case to be dismissed. Number one, Ellsberg was illegally wiretapped. Number two, the administration, Nixon and Mitchell, had a meeting with the, the trial judge, Matt Byrne, okay, in which 
they while the trial was in process and they offered him the FBI directorship all right and the third what was the third thing they also oh how could i forget they burglarized Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. All right, you know Hunt and the Cubans and those and Gordon Liddy and those guys. Mm-hmm. You know because Nixon wanted to get dirt on Ellsberg. All right, and so once those three things were exposed, the case was dismissed. Now, another important thing that nobody talks about. Russo did not want to dismiss the charges. He wanted to go through to a verdict, all right, because he thought they were doing pretty well. And it turned out that when they interviewed the jurors, they would have been acquitted. The tally was seven to acquit, five to convict, and two undecided. Hmm. So, so they would have won the case anyway, all right. So that's the third aspect of the Pentagon Papers is the criminal trial. Now, see, what I've described to you is a very long, complex series of events in which – and by the way, in that description, I've left out probably two-thirds of the story. You know, But what Spielberg and Hanks do is they take just one aspect of it, the Washington Post aspect, which lasted two weeks. Like I said, the Pentagon Papers case went on for almost three years. You know, so they try and condense this into the two-week interval that the Times uh, passed off. Well, not passed off, but the responsibility for publishing went from the Times to the Post. And they never explained how and why it happened. Now, let me tell you something even more shocking. James Goodale the general counsel for the New York Times, when he heard the film was being produced, asked to see a copy of the original shooting script. He was absolutely stunned when he saw it because in that original shooting script, there is no opening 15 minutes which features Ellsberg and the New York Times in it. So in other words, the original script, there was no New York Times, and there was only one scene with Ellsberg. That's when Bajdikian goes up to Cambridge to get the copy for the Post, the copy of the Pentagon Papers for the Post. And Goodale went spastic. He said, how the hell can you film a project on the Pentagon Papers and never mention the New York Times and make Daniel Ellsberg into a bit character. Hmm. So then they changed it and they added this prologue, which I think is about 12 to 15 minutes, which pictures Ellsberg in Vietnam meeting McNamara and Bob Comer of the Defense Department on the way back. All right. Going ahead and copying the Pentagon Papers. Okay. And that opening sequence takes about 12 – and by the way, it's the best part of the movie, if you ask me. All right? You know? And guess what? It would have never been there without James Goodale. Okay, so (laughs) that's the kind of film it was going to be. Now, my other objections, which I brought out in my review – and by the way, my book is coming out in a few weeks called JFK, The Evidence Today. And I wrote an entirely new chapter, ending chapter, in which I discuss this whole Pentagon Papers and the Post thing in a much longer way. My review is about 10 pages. In the book, it's the concluding chapter, and it's at least twice as long. All right. And one of the things that they do in the film, which I think is just so objectionable is that they manufacture a scene which comes near the end in which 
Kate Graham goes to visit McNamara. And there's two things going on in the scene, which which ends up being a shouting match. Graham is depicted as being surprised and stunned at what McNamara did in Vietnam. Okay? That's one part of it. And the Secretary of Defense McNamara ends the scene by tra- trying to talk her out of publishing the papers because she's, he's fearful of what Nixon will do. That is one of the most objectionable scenes in the whole film. Why? See, in my view, you can use dramatic license if the actions of characters taken in the film are consistent with what the real characters did in life. But it's a violation of dramatic license when what they do in the film is completely opposed to what they did in life. First of all, there's no evidence this scene ever happened. I read about 12 books. Now, obviously, that would have been in Kay Graham's book, Personal History. All right, it's not there. Hmm. Right? And she devotes all of 12 pages of the Pentagon Papers in her book, which is Floyd Abrams told me, uh, that shows you what how important she thought it was to her. All right. Well, first of all, there's no evidence at all that Bob McNamara ever tried to prevent anybody from publishing the Pentagon Papers. In fact, like I've tried to say on more than one occasion, it was Bob McNamara who created the Pentagon Papers. All right? If it wasn't for him, they would have never been created. It was him who did that. It was him who kept them from Johnson. You know, and according to everybody involved in the project, Bob McNamara never exercised any editorship over the Pentagon Papers. And in fact, Gelb Gelb said that when he started the project, McNamara took him to his house, opened a big closet door, and gave him reams and reams and reams of documents. Hmm. All right. And he said, words to the effect, let the chips fall where they, may, where they may. And he told them, I'm afraid that once this story gets out, that there's going to be a lot of people saying we never had these documents. So we're going to get the jump on them. All right. So that's just an utterly false characterization in that scene in the film. And then the other thing is the idea that Graham – was surprised at what McNamara did in Vietnam. Oh my God. To show you how bad that is, you have to go back to 1964. When Lyndon Johnson took the presidency after JFK was assassinated, he knew two things. Number one, he was going to break with Kennedy's policy because as you know, and anybody informed individual knows today, you know, Kennedy was withdrawing from Vietnam at the time of his assassination in Sam 263, all right, which was slowly over time, in about the space of about three months, uh, it was completely neutralized because Johnson decided that Kennedy didn't really know what he was doing. He did, and so he was going to go ahead and escalate the war. All right, but he knew that he would have to have the Washington Post, a local newspaper, on his side. Because at that time, the Washington Post was the number one circulation newspaper in the Capitol, and it was read just by about everybody on Capitol Hill. All right. He had Catherine Graham and the executive staff of the paper over to his house and in I think it was April of 1964 he revealed to them his plans to escalate the war in Vietnam now during the presidential campaign that year 
if you recall. Johnson completely disguised what he was going to do. And he tried to paint Goldwater as the hawk. And he said things like, I will not send American boys to Asia to do what Asian boys should do. And we seek no wider war. Well, this is a bunch of baloney. All right. And Graham had to know that. But then when he started escalating the war in 65, he sent her to Vietnam to visit General Westmoreland, who he had made the commander in chief of all forces in Indochina. So she got the whole tour. And she came back exhilarated. A meeting of her editorial board said, does anybody think we should bring up the idea of withdrawal? One guy raised his hand. She said, you're so stupid. Mm. All right. So, and I go on and on with this. Okay. Because there was also the fact that the Washington Post, when Johnson got through the Tonkin Golf Resolution, the Washington Post not only backed the resolution, they criticized it only two senators who voted against it. The Post even attacked Martin Luther King when he came out against the war in 1967. All right, they said he had forfeited his moral authority on the civil rights movement by going against the president. You know, and then Ben Bradley did something extraordinary. Right before the Tet Offensive, he took his lead reporter, a guy named Ward Just, out of South Vietnam, brought in a guy named Peter Braystrip, and Braystrip ended up endorsing Johnson's view of the Tet Offensive, which that it was a terrible failure for Hanoi and a great victory for the United States, oh, which is pretty crazy. I think by by anybody's estimate, all right? And so that's how much the Washington Post was in Johnson's pocket through those crazy escalations, you know, from 1965 all the way up to 1968. So the idea that Graham was, oh, I'm you know, sort of like that scene in Casablanca where Claude Rains comes in and, says, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that there's gambling in this hotel. You know? So I'm sorry, that's just a piece of fiction. All right, that they made up. You know, and like I said, for those reasons that it's the opposite of what each character would have done or said, it's not at all justified. Hmm. All right. So I was very disappointed in the film. Now let me say this, and there yeah it is well done. All right. Spielberg has usually been a, a good visual director, you know, and Kate Graham, played by Meryl Streep, she's a very capable actress, all right? But that does not make up for what I believe is a falsification of history, you know, it's in, in, in very many ways. I, the heroes and the heroines of the Pentagon Papers case were not Ben Bradley. They were not Kate Graham, all right? That was an accident, you know, something totally unforeseen. You know, the heroes of the case were, of course, Ellsberg and Russo, Linda Sine for letting them copy the documents, you know, and also Mike Gravel, the senator who read them into the congressional record, it was also Judge Gerhard Gazelle, who in the lower decision, sided with the Washington Post twice, not once, but twice. You know, it was those people. Those people are the heroes, you know, of, of the Pentagon Papers case, you know. So, you know, I just, I'm, I'm very, very disappointed in the film. See, and so, in my opinion, the only way to tell this story, if you are really a serious historian, which Spielberg and Hanks think they are, but they're really not, you know, the only way to tell this story, I would think, is through a four-night miniseries. You know, like two hours a night for an expanse of eight hours. If you were really serious about telling the truth, 
you know, it, it's a great, great subject because to give you just one example, in I think 1969, when Ellsberg was turning from uh, Hawk to Dove, maybe 68, uh, he went to a talk that Kissinger did at I think Rutgers University. He was in the audience, and when Kissinger was done, now imagine this scene if you could just let your visual and dramatic imagination let go for a while. Here is this national security advisor who everybody thinks is so smart and such a great maestro of foreign policy, and here comes Ellsberg, his former student, who raises his hand, stands up. And ask this guy, how many civilians do you and Nixon plan on killing in Indochina this year? <laughs> Can you imagine that scene? Hmm. All right. And what I would have done if I, if I was directing that scene, I would show Kissinger. Then I would do a transition flashback as he's fidgeting at his podium, which Ellsberg said he was, you know. And to the White House, and I would show Nixon on one side, Kissinger on the other side of the Oval Office, and Nixon saying – and by the way, this is absolutely true. It happened. He said, that's the difference between me and you, Henry. I don't care how many civilians we kill. And Kissinger said something like, uh, Mr. President, I don't like you looking like a butcher. And I would flash back to that scene because that's the kind of guy President Nixon was. You know, the, the full story about just how the horrible president he was has not come out yet because there's still some of those tapes that are missing. Mm. But this is the reason he fought so hard. It was scenes like that that he fought so hard during his lifetime to keep those tapes bottled up. Wow. All right. And so then I would come back to the present and have Cameron Ellsberg waiting for his reply. And finally, the moderator bailed out Kissinger. But that's the kind of movie you could have if you really stayed true to the people involved and also the record. But see, you know, as I said at the conclusion of that review, I said, you know, in my opinion, that's too hard edged of a film for Hanks and Spielberg. It cuts too much to the quick about modern American history. You know, see, when when Spielberg did Amistad, you know, that was that took place like in the early 1800s. OK, this is relatively recent history, you know. Right. And, and by the way, one last thing I want to point out. The film implies at the end that it was the Pentagon Papers case that went ahead and caused Watergate. And that's what a lot of people thought. They thought that the uh, the plumbers unit with Hunt and Liddy and McCord was created to stop the leaks in the Pentagon Papers case and to go ahead and do the raid on Ellsberg psychiatrist's office. It turns out that through the work of Bob Perry and Ken Hughes, that's not the case. The, the plumbers unit was created. Because Nixon was so worried about what he did to rig the 1968 election. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. With Anna Chenault, okay, and Bo Dam, who was the South Vietnamese ambassador, and how Johnson was trying to get peace talks going throughout the summer and fall of 1968. All right. And Nixon knew about this and he obstructed, got in contact with President Chu in Saigon, told him not to agree to any meetings to deprive Johnson of making that announcement during the campaign to hurt Humphrey, who was Nixon was running against. And then I think three days before the election, Chu made a speech in Saigon. That was carried 
by all three networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC. And you're probably old enough to understand back then that was it. You didn't have this proliferation of all these cable networks and Fox News, etc. You know, so if you got those three networks, you got almost everybody who's watching television at the time. All right. And he made a speech in which he said he would not participate in any peace talks. And he tried to say that somehow that Johnson was sandbagging him and his cause. And that really decided the election. Humphrey was gaining on Nixon and that put the kibosh on it. Well, Johnson suspected that that's what Nixon had done. So he put the FBI and the CIA on the trail, and they came up with proof that that was the case. And Hoover told Nixon about that when Nixon was in his transition period, and Nixon was very worried that that file would be exposed. He actually put a young uh, staff aide, Thomas Charles Houston, Mm -hmm. on the trail of finding that file. And he thought it was at the Brookings Institute, which it was not. But that's when on the tape, Nixon says, then we have to firebomb the Brookings Institute, create some kind of diversion, break in there. That's how the plumber's unit began. Or again, that would probably be too hard-edged, you know, for because it says that Nixon's not only violated the law, the Logan Act, which prohibits private citizens from interfering in diplomacy, but also stole the election. You know, All right. so that's another thing that I think is false about the film. Well, it sounds like a very, you called it at the end of your view, a combination Washington Hollywood fairy tale. I, I've heard you talk about a, a chapter in one of your books uh, where you talk a lot about kind of the CIA's interaction in Hollywood, do you think that this uh, film was produced just to make a good story, or do you think there's something more about trying to raise the profile of the media? Uh, why was Tom Hanks involved, knowing knowing the way he looks at the things like the JFK assassination, do you think? Okay, I guess we should explain to the listenership. I have written in the past about 20 pages on the CIA in Hollywood. It's a very important subject. And I talked about Charlie Wilson's war in that regard, all right, which was another very bad movie by Tom Hanks, which completely distorted the whole United States, Afghanistan, Taliban struggle. All right. And in that instance, he did have a CIA consultant on that film. Now, on this one, I haven't been able to find any evidence of that. All right. Hanks and Spielberg, they're so politically naive that somehow they say they did this movie because they wanted to try and revive the concept of a free press against Trump's war on the fake news thing, as if the two situations are somehow anywhere comparable or parallel. You know, I, I don't see how things like Stormy Daniels all right, and uh, Russiagate. I don't see how any of that parallels going into a third world country using a false event as a declaration of war and then going ahead and laying waste to that country for a period of around 10 years. And taking the lives of at least four million people and in Cambodia another million or two. I, I don't understand how that equates to each other. 
You know, it, it doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't at all to me. You know, and in, in my reissue of my book, I'm also going to point this out that if that was the case, then where were Spielberg and Hanks when Barack Obama was doing more to violate freedom of press than any other president in history? You know, Goodale told me that. He's been watching this. You know, and he said, you know, Obama was the worst president, worse than George W. Bush mm-hmm. on this issue. So, you know, I, I just don't see – I mean that's another way to me of showing how politically naive they are. And they're, they're very bad understanding, you know, of modern history. You know, the, the, it, it's, it's really kind of sad, you know, the, 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 you know what, what these guys are up to. You know, and 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 their record in that, you know, I'm I'm ve- very disappointed. You know, I, I told Goodale, I go, who do these people get to do their research for them? You know, because remember, in the first draft of the script, if it wasn't for Goodale, there would never even be that long thing about Ellsberg in Vietnam or the New York Times at all. You know, so that's that's what you're up against with these guys. They think that they're doing a good thing. I don't agree with that at all. You know, I mean, Tom Hanks, just take a look. First, there was Parkland. Yep. Then there was Charlie Wilson's War. Now there's this movie. I mean, what kind of a record is that? You know? Yeah. No, uh, Charlie Wilson's War was one of the worst movies and just one of the strangest movies I've ever seen. So I don't see how Tom Hanks has become such a cultural icon. But, uh, you know, I think of all the valuable things you do on your website and in your writing, taking these reviews of books and movies, and especially movies like this that are just kind of meant to paint a, a completely false picture of our recent history. Your reviews of them are one of the most valuable things you do, of all the valuable things you do on your site. So... I think this was this was really interesting and sets the story straight. You know, I think this is a good good thing to do. Well, th- th- thank you so much, David. Yeah, no, thank you, and uh, yeah, I look forward to talking to you again. This is our hidden history.